Hi everyone, Mike from Lunch Money Comics here. Today I'm in New Milford, Connecticut at the famous Elephant Trunk Flea Market. It's December, it's one of the last outdoor flea markets of the year. Let's go find some comic books. No, I just like, I like everything, so. Oh, okay. I know, I know. What do we got? Are they... Oh, yeah? Yeah. I got a hockey puck game, so weird. $2,000. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mental note. <laughs> oh, I have one. He signed it and he donated it to auction my dad one time. Oh, wow. He used to have a restaurant in the last year. Oh, that's crazy. So I have an auction thing. Oh, nice. I'm 
good holiday yeah. if I don't see you. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll probably see you as soon as I can. Yeah, I'll probably. <laughs> Have a good holiday. Thank you. Oh man, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an early reprint, but wow, good picture there. It's cool though. It's wicked cool. cool but it's missing staples and there's supposed to be 36 pages which there are definitely not yeah geez this one comes down to condition wow staples check hmm Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Yum. Okay, I'm back in the car. I'm really cold. Uh, I was there for about an hour and a half, and uh, after a long search, I finally found some comic books worth looking at. And uh, I got some really interesting ones, guys. I'm not sure if I got a really good deal or not. I'll leave it up to you. But I also got some Christmas shopping done, and uh, I got myself a cider donut. So happy morning for me. Feeling pretty good. I'll see you guys at home. So there you go, guys. That was Elephant's Trunk Flea Market in New Milford, Connecticut. As far as flea markets in New England go, by all accounts, Elephant's Trunk is like the second biggest flea market after Brimfield. The big difference is that Brimfield's only around three weeks during the year, and Elephant's Trunk is open every single Sunday from April to December. You can tell from the footage that I was there in mid-December, and um, it was either the last flea market of the season or it was like the second to last. Either way, it was really cold, and I did not expect many people to be there, but... I was surprised. There were a lot of vendors and a lot of shoppers there for this sort of like holiday themed flea market. But just looking out at the fields they have, the property they have, um, I could totally imagine just how big this flea market is in the prime of summer. I've never been able to go in the summer. It's just one of those things that's a little too far from me, but I will make sure to go in 2023. If you want to visit Elephant's Trunk and you live in Southern New England or especially New York, it's really close to the New York border, I will make sure to put a link down in the description to the information for it so you can check it out and hey, maybe I will see you there next summer. So despite the lower temperatures and the smaller number of vendors, I still found comic books. Guys, I tell you all the time, no matter where you go, you can find comic books if you look hard enough. And there were not only comic books here, but there were a lot of vendors selling comic books. And uh, what I usually do with these types of flea markets, especially where I can like see everything, what I'll do is I'll like make a couple of rounds, just take an inventory of what's there, you know, get an idea of what I wanna buy, and then I'll kind of go back and, and buy things. But that's not really what happened here. Um, I basically got five books all from the exact same vendor, and it was the last guy I looked at, like right on the way out. And because of that, you know, even though I had a sort of mental picture of other stuff I wanted, I was cold, I was tired, it was a long drive back. I didn't go back and pick up some of the things that you saw in the footage. One of them I really wanted and completely forgot about until I was editing the video was that small Fantastic Four book. Really cool, it was from the 60s. Uh, maybe I'll find it again someday. But otherwise, I got five books all from the same vendor. And um, talking about a spread of ages here, I got five books spanning all the way from the Copper Age all the way back to the Golden Age. So before I get into what I bought, if you like this sort of stuff, go down, hit that like button, leave me a comment. I love reading and responding to every single one of them. Uh, feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. Find me on Instagram under Lunch Money Comics IG. Now let's get to the comic books. So as I said, all five comic books I got from the same vendor. And as for what I paid, I got them as like a bulk price. I got all five of them for $100. The first three, pretty straightforward. I got them for half of what their sticker price was. And the last two is a little complicated. I'll explain that when I get to it. But I'm excited to show you the first comic book because longtime viewers of my channel know that I am a Marvel fan, almost exclusively. And for someone who has a YouTube channel on comic book collecting, I think it's kind of embarrassing that I don't give nearly enough DC love. So it is a personal New Year's resolution of mine to not only collect more DC comics, but read more. And that's where this book comes into play. 
Here we go, Detective Comics number 574 from 1987. Amazing cover art by Alan Davis and Paul Neary depicting Batman carrying the Jason Todd Robin. And this book here is a retelling of Batman's origin story. So I read it. Uh, of course, the irony is that it's Batman's backstory, which everybody knows his origin. So I learned nothing new. But it did confirm a longtime suspicion of mine that uh, Bruce Wayne is a terrible father figure. The book opens up with Jason Todd having been shot like four times. And that finally has Batman going, oh, geez, maybe I went a little too far this time. Yeah, of course you did, because all your Robins are kids. Um, so other than that, though, um, it was a really, really cool read. It has excellent art in it. And um, I got it for $5, half of what the sticker price is. Um, I thought it was in a pretty good shape when I got it, and I liked paying that $5. However, when I got back to the car, I realized there's some pretty good staining on the top of this book. I did not see, you know, in the sunlight. But still, um, here we go. Detective Comics 574. I bought a DC book. I read a DC book, and I'm making good on my New Year's resolution already. So for my next book, I got to go back to Marvel. Uh, people who have watched my channel know that I love Daredevil, and I have a pretty good collection of Silver Age Daredevil. The reason for this is simple. Of all the big Marvel marquee characters in the 60s, for a long time, Daredevil had the most affordable books. So whenever I found them, I scoffed them up. And um, like I said, I have a pretty good run, you know, from like, you know, the teens all the way up into like the 100s. But whenever I find a book in that run that I don't have, I have to have it. And that's why I got this one. Here we go, Daredevil number 46. It's from 1968, written by Stan Lee, art by Gene Colan. Um, it's not a key as far as I know, it just depicts a battle between Daredevil and the Jester. The Jester is, uh, well, a Jester-themed or another clown-themed villain akin to the Joker. Uh, he was a pretty good villain of Daredevil's throughout the 60s, and I think he first uh, premiered in number 42. So all these early 40s issues, um, Daredevil is fighting the Jester. I have a lot of them. I have a pretty good run of the, the 40s. Um, but I didn't have this one. And, uh, you know, it's not in the best shape. It's a dark cover. It shows a lot of color breaks. But I got it for half price. I got it for $7.50. So I was very happy to pay that price for some Silver Age goodness and add it to my Daredevil Silver Age box. There you go. So my next book is definitely a famous Copper Age key. Everyone knows what this book is. This is The Punisher number one from 1987, written by Mike Barton, art by Klaus Janssen. And of course, this is the first issue of Punisher's first ongoing series. Uh, he first appeared famously in Amazing Spider-Man number 129, a very expensive book. And throughout most of the 70s and early 80s, he appeared variously as an anti-hero and as an antagonist. But he did not have his own series until 1987. He did have a mini series that came out the year before in 1986, but uh, it's a pretty they're pretty hard books to find. Every time I've ever seen them, uh, they're kind of pricey. But this book is not rare at all. I see this book all the time, and um, honestly, I'm not a huge Punisher fan. I never really have been, but I've always remembered this book, you know, from my childhood as being a very collectible book for people who like the Punisher. So I've always kind of wanted this book, but it had to be for the right price and the right condition. And uh, like I said, I got it for half price and, you know, what is that, $17.50? I think is a pretty good price for it. It does have one spine tick. I would say the condition, um, this is pretty much like a $17.50 book. So uh, despite the fact I'm not a huge Punisher fan, um, he is a huge uh, Marvel character with a big following. And I'm really happy to add his first issue of his first ongoing series finally to my collection. So the total sticker price of these three books uh, added up to $60, so I got these for 30 bucks, which means my last two I got for the remaining 70. Now, I'll leave it up to you to determine whether or not I got a good deal, but this next book originally had a sticker price of $125, and you will see why this vendor uh, thought he had something worth a lot more than what he did. So you might have noticed in the footage that this vendor had a pretty good sampling of Golden Age comic books. But among all of them, one really jumped out to me above all the others. You saw it in the footage. Here we go. It is Key Comics number three from 1944, published by Consolidated Magazines, cover art by Walter Johnson. Um, and this book is a pre-code horror book. It's made up of the case of the skeleton key and six more original feature stories. All of them are horror or mystery themed. Now, I know Precode Horror is a really big, popular comic book collectible right now, and uh, it's not really my thing per se, but I don't really have any either. So when I see something like this, you know, my eyes kind of light up because I know a lot of people who love collecting this stuff and would be interested to have this. 
but he had a sticker price of $125. And for that price, I mean, just looking at it, I could tell the condition was bad, but for that price, it really needs to have more going for it, you know, inside. So I asked him if I could look at it and it was really windy and cold. And he said, yeah, you can use my the back of my car. So he opened up the back of the car so I could actually like lay the comic books down and inspect them. And I think you saw in the footage me looking at them. And um, this has much worse condition issues than it appears. Not only is it missing both staples and thus the whole cover wrap is detached, but it's actually missing some pages. How many pages? Well, I looked it up and there should be 36 and there's about 20. So it's missing a lot of pages. And when I told him that, he had no idea. He's like, oh, wow, like, yeah, it's not worth $125. So um, I think I spent about $25 for this. Now, like I said, I'm not really into these books. And truth be told, you know, a lot of times I buy comic books uh, because of the YouTube channel because I want to talk about them. I've tried being better about it. I try to only get comic books that I actually want, especially where I could just show you the footage and talk about it. But there was something about this book, even being, you know, not intact, even being, you know, in the bad shape it's in, something about it just spoke to me. And uh, maybe this is a book I put on the wall behind me. I don't know what to do with it, guys. Let me know down in the comments what you think I should do with a book like this when it's missing so much. But I thought it was really cool and really worth talking about on the channel. So maybe it's not worth $25 to own, but I think it's worth 25 bucks to discuss it on the YouTube channel. A uh, few other things about this book that it has going for it. Uh, one, the back of this book is pretty awesome because it has Captain Marvel on the back. So that's probably, to me, the coolest thing, being mostly a superhero guy, we have Captain Marvel slash Shazam on the back here. So that's pretty cool. And also, in the first page of this, it's really fragile, I gotta be careful. You see this first story, the key, you have like, you know, uh, death there. Um, with some potions and a skeleton key, or I don't know what's going on, but it's really cool and really creepy, uh, and has all the hallmarks of a uh, pre-code horror. So there you go, guys. Key Comics uh, number three, a pre-code horror book from 1944, or at least what's left of it. Which brings me to my final book. It's also a Golden Age book, but unlike that last one I showed you, this one doesn't have nearly the condition issues. In fact, this book I'm about to show you is the highest grade Gold Age book I've ever found at a flea market. So people ask me all the time, do I find Golden Age books at flea markets? Yeah, but they're usually like funnies or westerns or like Tarzan books. And although those are collectible and they can be worth money, they don't have nearly like the desire or the premium as like the superhero books or like the pre-code horror books. They're either that or they're trash and in terrible condition and often they're both. Case in point, the book I just showed you. But this book here, I saw it and it jumped out to me because of its appearance and just how high of a condition it actually is. You saw it in the footage and here we go. This is Topics Comics number nine from June of 1947. It's published by the Catechetical Guild, which you can tell probably based on its name, primarily published Christian stories, or at least stories that had Christian parallels, you know, how to live your life as a good Christian. This book here has about six or seven stories in it, and only one of them is really like biblically themed. All the other ones are all over the place. They're all pretty PG. Um, but the first story in it is about Vikings, and that's why you have this really cool cover of like Vikings wrestling. But what really jumped out to me besides its condition, was this trade dress. I mean, it's awesome looking. The colors, you know, the yellow and the orange on the blue background just really spoke to me. I don't know what it was. It looked really cool. But then I opened it up and looked at it, and it is an incredible shape. Now, I think it might have to do with the paper quality a little bit. You know, when I took it out, it's almost like cardstock. It's a very thick fiber paper that certainly uh, helped it stand the test of time. But also, I don't think anyone actually read this book. When you actually open it up, I mean, it, it's tight. It doesn't look like anybody ever broke any spine on this. So um, I just think it wasn't read and it was kept uh, in a nice dry place. It has uh, only really one blemish. I could see down on the bottom here, it is slightly folded, had a little dog ear. It's a little wrinkly, but that's it. It also had sort of a white residue on it, which at first I thought was almost like a, like a color lift. Um, but when I actually scrutinized it closely, I saw that it was almost like a powder and um, with my finger, it just started coming off. So I, I took a little bit of it off, but I didn't want to go nuts on it. I do want to give this to Comic Spa to kind of give it his once over and clean it up, you know, by a professional. I didn't want to damage the book. I don't know what it was. Hopefully it wasn't like, you know, uh, any like, you know, heavy metals that were coming out of the paint or like arsenic or something like that. Um, but it brushed right off and it presented even better. So um I don't know if there's much of a demand for these types of books. I did look them up to see, you know, if any had sold recently or what this would be worth. 
and I didn't find much. There are lots of issues by this, you know, catechetical guild, these topics comics. Um, most of them don't sell for a whole lot. But this specific book, I wanted to see like specific examples of it. Had it ever been like graded? Is there a market for it? So I looked on the CGC census and there's a grand total of two graded books. And the highest one is a 5.5, which at the time of me filming this, you could buy on eBay right now. This book as is, is easily a seven, maybe a seven five if it got cleaned up, who knows. But a part of me says I want to send this in to get graded just so I can say for once in my life, I have the highest graded copy of something in the world. I don't know. You guys let me know what I should do with this book. I just love the look of it. I just love the fact that it is 70 plus years old and it's in remarkably good shape. There's just something about this that makes me think back to the late 40s, what was going on, you know, what types of, you know, kids or people were reading books like this. I just thought it was fantastic. I thought it presented really great. Let me know down in the comments, guys, what you think of this book and what I should do with it. I think it was pretty awesome. I don't know what I paid for it. I think I probably paid the remaining like 30 or 40 bucks for it. He had a sticker price of like 60. So I still got it for a cheaper price, but I'm happy to pay that again. Highest graded golden age book I've ever found at a flea market. How could I walk away from it? So that was my trip to Elephant's Trunk Flea Market in New Milford, Connecticut. I hope to go back this summer and spend a lot more time there and make a nice big video where I get a lot more than five comic books. But in the meantime, go down to those comments, guys, and let me know what you think of my pickups. What do you think of these copper and silver age comics right here? But mostly, let me know what you think of these two golden age books, which quite honestly couldn't be further apart in condition or subject matter. Uh, in the meantime, guys, I hope you keep finding comic books in strange and unusual places. Uh, and until next time, this has been Lunch Money Comics. Thank you so much for watching.